So let's begin Unit 4. Unit 4 is about processes that occur under non-equilibrium conditions. Three important processes that we're going to be discussing in this unit are carrier transport, the movement of carriers that gives rise to electrical currents, uh, carrier recombination, where carriers disappear, and carrier generation, where carriers are produced. In the first three lectures of this unit, I'll be discussing carrier transport. In this lecture, I'll be introducing the general approach that we're going to be using for understanding transport. So, the flow of charge produces currents, and our goal is to understand how this all works, how this all plays out in semiconductors and eventually semiconductor devices. Now, when you take a chemistry course, you often begin by learning chemistry with the simplest possible atom, the hydrogen atom. We're going to take a, sim a similar approach. We're going to begin by asking ourselves what current flows in a very small nano device, and then we will extend those results to the more complicated bulk semiconductor with large dimensions later. So just to make a comment, this approach is very simple and intuitive, and I think it will be very easy to understand. But there are several deep issues that we won't, that we'll sort of gloss over and not dive into. For those of you that are interested in some of the deeper issues involved in this understanding of current transport processes, I can refer you to this set of lecture notes by my colleague Supriyo Data. Okay, so here's a little cartoon of our schematic nano device. We have two contacts and a device that is attached between those two contacts. The length of the device is L. This might be a small molecule. It might be a small chunk of silicon or other semiconducting material. These contacts are large. They have special properties. We're going to assume that they are always in equilibrium. They're large enough with a lot of scattering processes that can easily maintain equilibrium. But contact one will have a Fermi level one, and contact two will have a Fermi level two that may be different from the Fermi level in contact one. And that could occur, for example, if we apply a voltage. Voltage is lower energies. I'm going to make the assumption here that the temperatures of the two contacts are the same. They don't have to be, and other effects can arise when they're not. But for our purposes, we're going to assume that the temperature is constant. Our question then is, how does the current that flows in contact two depend on the voltages that I apply between these two contacts? All right. And we'll simply state the answer. The answer is simple. Easy to understand as, as we go through it term by term. There's a set of fundamental constants. There's a parameter that we'll discuss that we call the transmission, which is simply a number between 0 and 1 and represents the fraction of electrons that enter from contact 1 that emerge from contact 2. There is a number of channels. This is just the number of channels, different channels that the current can flow in. And there is a difference between the Fermi levels of these two ideal contacts. Fermi level 1 and Fermi, Fermi function 1 and Fermi function 2 must be different or current will not flow. So we'll discuss this expression in this lecture and try to get familiar with it. I'll point out that this can be derived from a more rigorous theory known as the Boltzmann transport equation. But it, as we spend some time with this equation, we'll see that it is simple, intuitive, and easy to understand. And this is going to be our basis for understanding current flow in semiconductors. So let's just go through term by term and, and develop an understanding for each of these terms, beginning with the transmission. So I could think of a semiconducting slab of some length L. There are various scattering processes within this slab that can knock electrons in random directions. These might be defects in the crystal. They might be vibrations of the lattice that are able to knock electrons around. The average distance that an electron travels between these scattering events that knock it into a new random direction is called the mean free path. We'll give it a special name, and we'll call it the mean free path for backscattering, and we'll denote it by a symbol uh, lambda. 
So if I can consider the condition first, where the average distance between scattering events is longer than the length of the semiconductor, then if I inject a flux of electrons from the left, most of them will just travel across without encountering any scattering. They'll all come out the other side. We would say the fraction that comes out the other side is 1. The transmission in this case is 1. This is a situation that we, that we call ballistic transport. It's actually the simplest um, level of carrier transport. When carriers are ballistic, things are much simpler and easy to analyze. Now there is the other limit. If the length of the semiconductor is very long compared to a mean free path, then there will be a lot of these random scattering events. If I inject a flux of electrons, they're going to undergo some kind of random walk. Some fraction of them might emerge from the right. That fraction would be the transmission, and that would be a number that's less than 1. Some fraction of them will emerge from the left side from which they were injected. And the number of those will be 1 minus the transmission. Assuming that there are no recombination or generation processes inside this lab that create or destroy electrons. So under these conditions, the transmission is less than 1. If the transmission is very small, that is if the length is much longer than a mean free path, we, call, we label that diffusive transport. And this is the regime of conventional, large-scale, large traditional semiconductor devices. So it's important, then, we see that the, the mean free path, the relation of the mean free path in relation to the length of the semiconductor determines the transmission. When the mean free path is long, we have ballistic transport. When the mean free path is short compared to the length of the semiconductor, we have diffusive transport. So there should be a formula that relates the mean free path and the length of the region to the transmission. And here's the formula. If you look at this formula, uh, we, can, we could derive this formula from a more rigorous theory from the Boltzmann transport equation. But it's also the simplest possible equation that we could write down that would do the right thing in the two limits. So for example, if the length is much longer than the mean free path, then the transmission reduces to mean free path divided by length and will be very small, much less than 1. This is our diffusive limit. If the length is much less than the mean free path, there will be little scattering, and this formula will give us 1. That's our ballistic limit. And if the length is in between, we'll have a quasi-ballistic transport, we would say. So what's important is this mean free path. The mean free path, we have to be a little bit careful of, and I'll discuss this in just a few slides later. But the mean free path is basically velocity times time, the time between these random scattering events. Uh, this is typically denoted by a capital lambda, Greek letter lambda. It turns out that the mean free path we need here is just a little different, which is why we're calling it a mean free path for backscattering. And I, I want to alert you to that. When people talk about mean free path, we have to be careful that we understand which mean free path we're talking about. Uh, so what is a mean free path for backscattering? Well, you can appreciate that here. If I'm in 1D, Let's assume that I have an electron that comes in and encounters some type of scattering potential that knocks it in a random direction. There are only two random directions in 1D, forward or reverse. If the electron got randomly knocked in the forward direction, it's as though nothing had happened. It's not going to perturb the flow of currents. So if I am looking at a situation like this, then what's important is the average time between backscattering events, because those will perturb the current flow. And that average time is 2 tau. So my mean free path would be velocity times 2 times the average time between collisions. So there's a difference. And this difference uh, uh, occurs in 1D, and 2D, and 3D. And we have to be careful that we're using the appropriate mean free path. Okay. All right. In this case, it's 2 times the velocity times time. Uh, in three, there's, there is a numerical factor in 2D for 2D electrons and for 3D electrons that is different from 2, but that numerical factor is always there. 
Now, I just want to mention, and again, we'll say a little more about this uh, later on, but there is a relation between the main free path and the diffusion coefficient. So you've probably all encountered Fick's law of diffusion before. Fick's law says that there's a flux of particles that diffuse down a concentration gradient. So it depends on how steep the concentration gradient is. It, particles diffuse from high concentration to low concentration. So there is a negative sign here. And the units of the flux are number per square centimeter per second. So in this particular formula, C is the concentration of particles and D is the diffusion coefficient that we would measure in SI units as meters squared per second, but semiconductor people like to quote diffusion coefficients in centimeters squared per second. Now, it turns out that there is a simple relation between the mean free path for backscattering and the diffusion coefficient. And that simple relation is here. It is a thermal velocity times the mean free path for backscattering divided by two. We'll see where that comes from a little bit later. But this is an extremely useful expression because you know, in this expression, we're assuming that the mean free path is independent of the energy of the electron. That turns out to be a good approximation for semiconductors like silicon. We're also assuming non-degenerate conditions. This velocity here is given by this expression, square root of 2 kT over pi m. It's a thermal velocity, but again, there are different ways that people define thermal velocities for different problems. This thermal velocity, physically what it is, is it is a unidirectional thermal velocity. It's the average velocity in one direction. So for example, it might be the average velocity in the plus x direction, or the average velocity in the minus x direction, in equilibrium. Now, in equilibrium, there is no average velocity. Since the average velocity in the plus x direction is equal and opposite to the average velocity of the electrons in the minus x direction, the overall average is zero. There is no movement in, there is no average movement in equilibrium. But this is simply the velocity directed along one of the six coordinate axes. So this expression can be very useful for us, and I bring it up here because often we can experimentally uh, deduce the value of the diffusion coefficient. And then we might ask ourselves the question, uh, what is the mean free path from this measured diffusion coefficient? This formula gives us a nice, convenient, easy way to deduce the mean free path. Uh, it assumes non-degenerate carrier statistics and uh, energy de independent mean free path. If you'd like to see some more discussion of this topic, I'll refer you to, to this reference. All right, now let's continue our discussion. We talked about transmission and mean free path, which controls the transmission. Let's talk about this quantity m of e, which tells us how many channels there are at the energy e. Well, my university is located two hours south of Chicago. We're connected to Chicago by a four-lane highway. Uh, this highway has two lanes that, that carry traffic from Purdue University to Chicago and two lanes that carry traffic back. The flow of cars on this highway can be thought of as a, as a current flow. And there are two channels or two lanes for current to flow in. So channels are like lanes for current to flow in. Another way to think about channels is from our energy versus momentum or energy versus wave vector plot for electrons and semiconductors. This might be a typical EK plot for electrons in the conduction band of silicon. If I go to an ener a specific energy E1 and I ask how many channels are there there? Well, I have to have a state and I do because there's a state right there. And it has to have a velocity so that the electrons can move in the plus x direction. Well, there's a positive slope. We know that the slope of the EK tells us the velocity. So there's a velocity in the positive x direction. I have a state. I have a velocity. There's one channel located right there. You know, more generally, this argument could be extended to two dimensions and three dimensions and could be used to extract the number of uh, channels. 
So we're going to be primarily considered with uh, concerned with three-dimensional semiconductors. We've computed the three-dimensional densities of states. We can compute the average velocity at which electrons are traveling in the plus x direction, multiply the two, and we can easily then get an expression for the number of channels at any given energy in the conduction band. Okay, we talked in the previous unit about, um, or I guess in unit two, we talked about the densities of states, how they vary with energy in 1D, 2D, and 3D. Well, a channel is velocity times density of states. For parabolic bands, one half mv squared is equal to energy. So velocity is proportional to square root of energy. So if I multiply each of these by the square root of energy, we can see how the number of channels varies with energy in 1D, it's independent of energy. In 2D, it goes as a square root of energy. In 3D, it increases linearly with energy as we go more and more into the conduction band. Okay, so we have summarized some of the key parameters. Transmission is a key parameter. We'll make use of that frequently now in the following discussion. And we've discussed channels in one dimension, two dimension, and three dimension, all under the assumption that we're talking about parabolic bands, that we have large structures with many channels so that we can use our densities of states. We're going to be focusing on this in this course on current flow in large three-dimensional semiconductors. So we'll be making use of expressions like this later on. You know, I mentioned earlier that the, there's a numerical factor between the traditional mean free path and the mean free path for backscattering, and I, arg I explained why it was 2 in 1D. If we go through a similar type of averaging over angles in 3D, we find that that numerical factor is 4 thirds. Okay, we've discussed transmission, we've discussed channels, we should now discuss this final factor F1 minus F2, because what this factor says is that the Fermi functions at the energy of interest must be different or current will not flow. So what's that all about? Well, we're going to use this term Fermi window is the, is the energy range over which current flows and it is the range of energies over which F1 minus F2 is non-zero. Well, this really allows us to understand conceptually how current flows in this small nano nano device. So let me assume that I have a chunk of silicon big enough that I can, it has a band structure that's similar to bulk silicon. It'll have an energy versus crystal momentum plot that looks like this. Let me assume that I have a Fermi level one in contact one. And then let me assume that I have applied a voltage to contact two. We remember from freshman physics that a positive voltage lowers the electron energy. A positive voltage on contact two will lower the Fermi energy in contact two so that it will be below the Fermi energy in contact one. Now, if I look at the states that have an energy less than the Fermi level of contact two, they are filled by contact two in all states. They're filled by contact one in all states. F1 and F2 are equal in these two regimes. So these uh, states in this current range will not contribute to current flow. But if I look at states in this current range, they're below the Fermi level of contact one, they're above the Fermi level of contact two, F1 does not equal F2. These are the states that are responsible for current flowing in my small nano device. So the way it works is this. Let's assume that the state is initially empty. Contact one looks and says, wait a minute, this state is below my Fermi level. It should be occupied. Contact one sends an electron in to occupy that state. Okay, but then contact two looks at that state and says, wait a minute. That state is above my Fermi level. It should be empty. So the electron flows out into contact two. The result of that process is that an electron has come in and has flown out, come in from contact one, has flown out from contact two. That gives me a current flowing positive in the opposite direction into contact two. So this is the physical picture for how current flows in a small nano device and this explains why F1 minus F2 must be non-zero in order for current to flow. 
So we can summarize uh, this, uh, this lecture. We've been trying to get comfortable with this very simple expression that is going to be the basis of our treatment of carrier transport in semiconductors. We spent some time understanding what transmission means, what number of channels means, and by understanding what the Fermi window is all about, we could explain in a very physical way how current flows in a small nano device like this. So with this background, we will continue the discussion in the next lecture by showing how this formalism can be applied to both small nano devices, but also to large bulk semiconductors as well. That's the topic for the next lecture.